Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the new Research Building 99, which we're all excited about. As you can tell, it's still a work in, in process. Um, but welcome, and from now on, we will host most of our research talks here in this very room. Our next talk um, is on December 4th with Dr. Pankaj Gemawat. He is here to discuss his new book on reinventing global strategy. He wrote an essay um, for the Harvard Business Review this year that stirred up a lot of controversy and a lot of... Um, conversations with Mr. Friedman. It was titled, um, The World is Not Flat, and he will be here um, talking about why he disagrees so vehemently with Tom Friedman. Today we welcome one of the leading scientists of our time to Microsoft Research, Dr. Craig Venter. In Seattle, he's here to discuss his autobiography, A Life Decoded. It's a pretty amazing life, full of adventure and accomplishment, of danger and death and discovery, competition, frustration, and triumph. And as the London Times pointed out, is the first in a new genre of autobiography, the molecular biography. While many scientists have written their life and work stories, never before has anyone had a completed file of their six billion DNA characters on which they could illuminate their life. But as Dr. Venter considers in the book, is a life decoded really a life understood? Dr. J. Craig Venter is currently the founder and president of the Craig Venter Institute, which specializes in high volume genome sequencing and explores the ethical and policy ramifications of genomic discoveries and advances. He's also the founder of Synthetic Genomics, a firm dedicated to using modified microorganisms to produce ethanol and hydrogen as alternative fuels. Please join me in welcoming Dr. J. Craig Venter to Microsoft Research. that better? <laughs> anyway, it's a uh, pleasure to be here with you today to uh, uh, talk about my book, uh, A Life Decoded. Uh, it's actually sort of four books in one. It's a, uh, a true biography uh, starting with uh, my youth in the San Francisco Bay Area, uh, being a really lousy student, uh, liking anything but school. So I built boats, I went surfing. Uh, took part in competitive swimming, and I uh, I only graduated from high school because I got a D minus instead of an F in a government class. <laughs> and uh, my government teacher, uh, I knew he was a, a kind of a right wing nut, so uh, I wrote a paper on why Barry Goldwater should be president. This was in 1964. Uh, <laughs> most of you probably don't know who Barry Goldwater is, but. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and, and this guy was so impressed that he graduated me, either that or he didn't want me back again. Uh, and so at age 17, I moved to Southern California to take up a surfing career. Uh, and that didn't last very long because I got drafted off my surfboard uh, and ended up as a, a corpsman in Vietnam. And uh, going from the very naive uh, uh, a period in uh, the San Francisco Bay Area to all of a sudden being thrust in the middle of a war and having uh, having a, a position to actually uh, practice medicine and use knowledge to change and affect people's lives uh, totally turned my life around. And w when I got out of Vietnam, I came back and started at a community college in the Bay Area. I transferred to UC San Diego with the intention of going to medical school, uh, but in the progress uh, of Taking classes there, I was introduced to high-end science with some of the top scientists in the world. Um, and I started doing just a, a simple experiment. It was digesting uh, uh, hearts down to individual cells. Uh, and I was fascinated just to watch them beat in tissue culture. And uh, adrenaline is one of my favorite compounds in life. Um, and so I squirted a little adrenaline on the cells and they beat harder and faster, just like the heart does. And so I just asked a few people uh, how that happened. Uh, it turned out nobody knew. Uh, they didn't even know where in the cell adrenaline worked, whether it worked on the membrane and there was a receptor for it. Uh, there was all these hypothetical receptors. Uh, 
So I did an experiment where I attached adrenaline to a glass bead so it couldn't get inside the cell, uh, and it proved that adrenaline actually worked on the surface of the cell. Uh, and I published my first paper as an undergraduate and uh, got so turned on to high-end research, I totally forgot about medical school and, uh, and kept going. So I, three years later, I got my PhD. Uh, I published 22 papers in three years. Uh, and uh, uh, you know, it just shows when, you, when you're focused, you can accomplish a lot. I'm sure this group knows that more than uh, most. Uh, it's also a, a sailing uh, biography. Uh, I talk about how I got my first sailboat actually in Vietnam. Uh, I did a surgical procedure for uh, uh, somebody who had, uh, uh, the harbor master who had gone to uh, Bangkok for his first R&R. &R, and he woke up with tattoos that he didn't have the night before. Uh, the tattoos were the name Mary tattooed across his fingers. And uh, he applied to have his uh, tattoos removed, but that was considered elective surgery, which is not allowed in a war zone. Uh, but he was supposed to be going to Hawaii to meet his wife, uh, <laughs> who, as you can imagine, his name was, was not Mary. Um, and so I, I, I thought this was such a sad story. I, I surgically removed his tattoos and did skin grafts. So he went to Hawaii as a war hero. Uh, instead of coming back as a casualty. <laughs> uh, I, that, I can imagine how tough that would be to explain how, why, why you had some other woman's name tattooed on your hands. But uh, he was so grateful, he gave me a 19-foot lightning uh, sailboat uh, that uh, I sailed in and out of the surf and up and down uh, the Da Nang coast. And I argue uh, in the book, it's, it's the only uh, lightning that had bullet holes in the sails. Uh, we, we got shot at uh, frequently. Uh, by both sides. Uh, as helicopters would come in, they would throw hand grenades at us to see how close they could get without hitting us. Um, you know, war zones are crazy places, but uh, uh, it, it builds with uh, stories of first, uh, first sailing in Vietnam and then uh, the San Francisco Bay and then expanding it to coastal sailing, then ocean sailing, uh, and then what I did with the Sorcerer Two expedition, uh, sailing my uh, now 95-foot sloop uh, around the world doing science uh, with what we've been doing with shotgun sequence into the ocean. Uh, it's a science biography as well in the sense that um, it shows uh, that nothing in science is linear, uh, that there's not a direct route uh, between one point and another. Uh, going on uh, to ask questions about adrenaline, I spent the next 10 years of my career working on isolating the adrenaline receptor from heart and human brain uh, to finally uh, have enough uh, protein just to get a little bit of peptide sequence so we could try and clone the receptor. Uh, so in 1984, I moved to the NIH, uh, and because now I had a pretty large unlimited budget, I took off a year and taught myself and my whole team molecular biology. There weren't too many people to learn, learn it from at the time. Uh, and we cloned and sequenced uh, the first neurotransmitter receptor from human brain. But it was such a slow, painful process uh, that uh, I was sure there had to be a better way. And it was, I got particularly excited in 1995 when Lee Hood and colleagues then at Caltech, uh, before they came up here to Washington, published a paper where they attached four different fluorescent dyes to the four different bases of DNA. And as those ran by um, a photomultiplier tube after being activated by a laser, it switched to digitizing the information. Uh, my lab and I got the first machine. Uh, we published the first gene sequence by automation. And this was right around the time there was the first discussions about sequencing the human genome. And I just got very excited about the project. Uh, uh, even that you know, it was supposed to be a multi-billion dollar project spent over 15 to 20 years uh, to get all the human genes. You know, I just spent a decade trying to get one. Uh, in fact, there were five or six labs working on that same uh, one over that decade. That seemed like a great deal just to have them all in a short period of time. Uh, 15 or 20 years sound pretty short after 10 years. Uh, and we started sequencing uh, the genome uh, at NIH, doing test sequencing. Uh, 
and found the biggest problem was the interpretation. Uh, we could get hundreds of thousands of letters of genetic code, uh, but unlike bacteria, which are about 95% gene coding regions, the human genome, it, we only have about 3% of our sequence codes for proteins. Uh, and it's very hard to find in the background. So it's a four letter code, six billion letters, there's no algorithm yet that's good at predicting genes in the human genome. The only way we could actually verify them is to have a cDNA clone from uh, cells expressing RNA, uh, sequence those and then compare them back. And that's where I got the idea just to do this randomly and that's what led to the EST method. I've just tried randomly selecting cDNA clones uh, from a brain library and sequencing those. And so instead of one gene per 10 years, uh, I was discovering hundreds a day in my lab. Uh, we published the first paper on this in 1991. And this is where I started to learn that breakthroughs in science can really piss people off. Uh, it, you know, you think, you know, you're, you get a big breakthrough, everybody's gonna love you for it. Uh, it's quite the opposite, because there were all these labs around the world in the midst of their 10 to 15 year steps to isolate the genes they were working on. And all of a sudden, I started just randomly discovering all their genes and, and publishing them. And, uh, you know, I used to get angry letters that I, I'd ruined the research of postdocs and graduate students uh, uh, by making the discoveries too, way too easy. Um, you know, it, it's, it's, it's tough even in the scientific community to move forward. Uh, but the randomness approach uh, became key. Uh, we had a team that developed a new algorithm for assembling sequences. So it, in the 80s, the best algorithms could only deal with a thousand sequences. And that's why that really affected the strategy that the government adopted for the human genome, is the assumption was you can only sequence small pieces of DNA. So it was a huge project. You had to break the six billion pieces down into small pieces and distribute those around the world. Uh, to be sequenced. So we developed an algorithm that could assemble large numbers of the ESTs, and we thought this might be useful for something in genomics. And so it wasn't obvious, all, all of a sudden uh, we decided we would sequence a bacterial genome to see if we could use this algorithm in an intelligent fashion. Uh, e. coli genome took 13 years of government funding to do, uh, we applied for a grant to try this new method and were turned down, saying it was impossible. Uh, and four months later, we managed to sequence and assemble the genome just by shattering the genetic code, sequencing five or 600 letters from the pieces, then using the algorithm to reassemble it in the computer. And the algorithm's pretty simple in, in concept. Uh, those of you who have done jigsaw puzzles, it's, it's just no different than picking up a piece of a puzzle and comparing it to all the other pieces till you have a match. Only we're using strings of letters that are 500 letters long and trying to find um, significant overlaps with the other pieces uh, that are fractured randomly. Uh, on its own, if sequence was perfectly accurate, there'd be no issues, it'd be the simplest problem. The trouble is there's errors in the sequence and so the algorithms have to account for all the errors um, uh, other variations in the human genome where you might get accidental matches and things like that. Uh, but it was very straightforward. So we went from 13 years to four months. Uh, and I was sure this was the method that would be used for sequencing the human genome. Uh, but we couldn't convince uh, any of the government agencies to fund us to do that because they were set up for this distributed program. Uh, so we were sort of giving up on it and I got a call from uh, the instrument company that was making all the instruments for sequencing and they had a new version coming that they thought would be work particularly well with our whole genome shotgun method. Uh, and I got a call from somebody in the sales force there that said they had $300 million for me to sequence the human genome. Was I interested? Uh, and, and I hung up on the guy. I thought it was a crank call. I thought it was a reporter playing a game or something. But uh, uh, fortunately they called back. Um, and, and it turned out they were real. The, the caveat was we had to start a company to do it. They wouldn't fund my institute. Uh, and that led to the formation of Celera uh, Genomics in 1998. Uh, we set out quickly to, um, to build a center for sequencing the human genome quite rapidly. And we did a pr test project with the fruit fly genome. 
so fruit fly is 180 million base pairs. Haemophilus, five years earlier, was only 1.8 million. Uh, the number of pairwise comparisons is the number of sequences squared. So with Haemophilus, we only had to do 25,000. For Drosophila, we had to do 3 million sequences. And for human, we did 27 million sequences. So the problem kept getting bigger and bigger. Uh, we had to build uh, one of the largest computers in the world, at least according to Compact in 1999. Uh, it, it's small by t today's standards. It was 1.5 teraops. Uh, I think my laptop does almost that now. Um, but uh, it's not even in the top couple hundred uh, of what computers are. But there was nothing at the time that could do that calculation. And even with that, it, it took several months to actually assemble uh, the human genome, in part because the, uh, the alpha chips we were doing failed about half the time, which didn't help. Uh, but things have gotten a lot more stable. Uh, we just, in September of this year, published the first complete version of the human genome, the actual uh, a, a diploid genome, what was done in, uh, by the government effort uh, in 2000-2001 was half the genome, the haploid genome, uh, thinking that uh, if half was going to cost three billion, they better not tell Congress there was another half that was missing, um, and assuming that it could be easily inferred. And so what came out of the thinking from 2000-2001 is that we all have the same sets of genes, uh, and we differ from each other only by one out of a thousand letters of genetic code. So what we just published in uh, PLOS Biology shows that now we're more like one to two percent different from each other. Uh, and we don't all have the same sets of genes and uh, human variation is extremely high, uh, which I find quite uh, comforting. The one to two percent, to put it in context, we thought, and you'll find it in every textbook, we differ from chimp chimpanzees by 1.27%. So if we're 1% to 2% different and we're only 1% different from chimps, something's wrong. Um, uh, but fortunately, that chimp number changes too with this data. Uh, it's more like 5 to 6% difference between humans and chimps. Uh, there's been all kinds of companies, research labs, setting up just to measure these single nucleotide polymorphism changes which end up to be only about 25% of the base pairs that are variant in the human genome. Uh, so, ironically, having more variation uh, in understanding that will get us to preventative medicine paradigms uh, a lot sooner. Uh, the fourth track of the book, and these are boxes in the book uh, where I just pick out different interesting traits uh, that help explain things uh, to try and put the genome in context. Uh, really trying to do that in context of my life was uh, uh, I don't think we know enough yet how to interpret the genome, how to do that. But some simple traits, uh, eye color. Most people look at their parents, look at siblings and try and work out, you know, these seemingly simple links. Uh, you cannot tell from my genome that 100% chance that I would have blue eyes. It's a multigenic trait. A couple of different cell types are involved, uh, environmental factors. Uh, and, and hopefully people see that as a, an example of what we view as a simple trait. If we then try and look at complex behavior, personality, uh, different types of intelligence, complex diseases, they're not going to be this notion that's been out there now for a while of uh, changes in single genes are going to explain biology. Uh, there's a few others there that were in there for uh, fun. There's a uh, a dopamine receptor change that uh, was supposed to be associated with high-risk behavior. Uh, my team was very disappointed when I didn't have those genetic changes, uh, but they felt a little bit better on uh, after uh, more examination that I, I have, uh, I'm, I'm halfway through, uh, uh, you know, the uh, range of variation for high-risk behavior. But to me, it really doesn't matter because it's, again, trying to explain a complex behavior by a change in a single gene is extremely uh, naive. So there's a lot of different uh, tracks in this. Um, uh, you know, if you like sailing, you'll enjoy it. Uh, if you like science, you, you might. And there's a little bit of politics and other things thrown in for, for good flavor. So with that, uh, thank you for coming. I'm happy to take your questions. Yes. Uh, 
And do people need to do, use a microphone? How yeah. does it? Okay. You were talking about how roughly three percent of the DNA, the human DNA, is actually expressed. Um, so what what's expressed is proteins. I mean, there's what's the other ninety-seven percent. I, I believe it's so-called junk DNA. Yeah. Can you, uh, can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah. No, no, it's a great question. It, again, it shows, you know a combination of ignorance and arrogance of the genetics community early on when it was found that only a few percent coded for protein, that the rest must be junk. I mean, it's, it's, it's really incredible. Um, Sidney Brenner summarized it best, uh, you know, when we didn't know what it was, who uh, said that uh, junk is what you store in your attic, rubbish you throw out. Uh, and and I, I challenged people who thought it was all uh, rubbish to uh, let us dissect it out of their chromosomes and throw it away. Um, so in fact, we, we, we published an interesting paper uh, earlier this year with Sidney Brenner on the elephant shark genome. I don't know if any of you guys have seen a picture of an elephant shark. They are extremely ugly characters. Uh, it's one of the oldest, uh, earliest forms of a cartilaginous fish. And on sequencing its genome, we found that its non-coding regions, so-called junk, uh, was ex you know, very high level of identity with ours in the human genome. Uh, one and a half billion years at least of separation. Uh, and what that distance tells us is uh, to have um, sequences that are conserved over that length of time uh, have to have unique functions conserved with them. Uh, so we've, most of us have known all along it was important, we just knew it was going to take a while to find out what. The discovery of these regulatory RNAs uh, are, they come out of the so-called junk DNA, and they don't code for protein. So the notion that a gene has to code for a protein is, uh, the definition of a gene used to be something that just uh, was a genetic element associated with a trait. Uh, and it got converted and simplifying things that are coded for a protein. But now we have things that just code for RNAs that in fact regulate gene expression of other genes. And I'm sure as the century goes on, we're trying to scale up now to sequence 10,000 human genomes uh, to compare across the genome of all these different individuals, having clinical records, having phenotypic information, life outcome information. Uh, these approaches and others I think will help uh, lead to uh, a better understanding of the correlation of the rest of our DNA uh, with uh, regulation and our function, but uh, d don't throw it out. Yes? Um, so the fact that in 2001, 2002, it was only half, that seemed to get very little attention in popular articles. And what I'm wondering is, so now that you've done the diploid, are there other still missing pieces or other milestones that are gonna be coming in the next few years? So could everybody hear the question? Okay, so um, it, you know, even with the diploid genome and it being much more complete than anything that was published before, uh, it's still not 100% complete. That sequencing technologies we have don't work well in these repetitive regions around telomeres and centromeres. Uh, the heterochromatin where you have the same repeat uh, of 50 base pairs in maybe five or 10,000 copies. Uh, you know, so we, we don't have all that information. We don't have 100% of the linear code, but we're going to start getting that uh, more and more. So we're now using all these new technologies that are emerging uh, to resequence uh, n not only new genomes, but uh, using them all to test against my genome uh, to try and fill in the gaps that are still there. Uh, most of the gaps that have come up in genomes are due to pieces of DNA that don't clone well in E. coli. Uh, they just get deleted out. And a lot of the new techniques now are cell-free. They're just straight amplification systems, so they don't go through E. coli. So we, we know with many genomes, we close gaps with that. Uh, I don't think we'll find a new set of chromosomes or anything, but I think we will get more complete uh, information uh, and I think over this next century, we will constantly be amazed about correlations in the genetic code uh, with very interesting findings about ourselves. Yes? Um, to build on that, it appears that epigenetics plays a very important role in disease states and outcomes. And so these, whether it's methylation,
so epigenetics is you know covers a vast array of things from uh, uh, imprinting, uh, which is as you say is due to methylation, where the chromosome we get sometimes from our father plays a disproportionate role, or the one we get from our mother does, over what you would account for just based straight uh, genetics. Uh, regulation of gene expression, unfolding of chromatin, environmental factors, uh, just stochastic events. So identical twins, uh, and I, there must be uh, somebody in this room that has identical twins in their family, just sort of statistically. Is, is there anybody that... Uh, Boy, this is a bad representation of the population. <laughs> <laughs> Identical twins that have the same genetic code don't have the same bodies. They have different fingerprints. Uh, brains can be wired slightly differently. When you go from one cell to 100 trillion cells, there's so many random stochastic events and so many epigenetic events uh, from the environmental factors that we have no clue about yet. You can run that same experiment over a thousand times and not get the same answer twice. Uh, that's why, you know, cloned armies that people are worried about, uh, you know, the same genetic code, some of them would be rebels no matter what, so. Yes? I'm curious to hear your opinion on this. The, uh, you know, single uh, change in DNA uh, often can produce a new function. Uh, it's not a disaster to have a single change somewhere, whereas the opposite is true in software. Well, it, it depends on the changes, and, and there are certainly uh, changes you can have in software that are, you know, not so deleterious, and others, uh, there's a description of uh, uh, the algorithm for the genome assembly when we were doing the fly assembly, it just didn't work, and it just turned out it was one line out of half a million in the code that the team had written that was flawed. Um, we give examples of what we've done on this horse or expedition where we discovered these new photoreceptors in almost every organism in the upper meet, uh, three meters of the ocean. Turns out one letter change in the genetic code determines the amino acid that determines the wavelength of light that these photoreceptors see. Uh, and that wavelength of light determines who survives in what environment. Uh, and we've seen that we have evidence that there's been a switch between blue and green light four times in recent evolution. So that's a case where that one letter change is extremely important and uh, if you're out in the middle of the Sargasso Sea and you get a mutation switching to green light that your photoreceptor sees, you won't survive. So th there, there's lots of similar analogies uh, to software. We just have a lot of code where maybe it's the, uh, the spacing that's important, the distance, uh, you know, we're, we're not sure what, but there are areas that we can take a lot more mutations and they don't have the same effect. Uh, but there's plenty where just one letter change can determine whether the organism li lives or dies in a particular environment. So, uh, you know, in our own genetic code, it, in, in my genome, for example, 44% of my genes, the protein coding regions, have heterozygous variants. And so we were thinking of the genome in this homogeneous fashion uh, the proteins you get from each of your parents could be very different from each other and very different than the rest of the population. And we have to work out what that biology does. And then you have to multiply that by 10,000 different effects to, you know, no wonder we're all different. It's, you know, it's good that we are. Um, but it's not surprising when you look at these events. But I don't think it's going to be the same as in these bacteria. We can get down to one base, chair, base pair change defines any human. Um, it, it's going to be the accumulation of all the different changes, with rare exceptions, things like Huntington's disease. Yes? When, when you were at Celera, did you know that you wanted to have your personal genome sequenced? And can you talk about the thing, the, what led to, you know, what was it, two-thirds of the Celera data actually being from you? Yeah. I, I described that quite a bit in, in the book, as it, it, it's been a hot issue until recently, until now everybody wants to have their genome done. So. <laughs> Uh, but at the time, the biggest concern in human genetics was that it was going to be horrible to have your genome sequenced, and whoever was going to have their genome sequenced, we had to absolutely ensure their privacy, not, you know, here it is, the, the, the most identifying code of anything about somebody's life, and yet it was supposed to be anonymous somehow. Uh, 
Um, people were afraid of genetic determinism. And the assumptions, when you go back and look what people were thinking less than a decade ago, uh, that we had 100 to 300,000 genes because people wanted biology to be linear and have one gene for every trait and function. Uh, some religious groups wanted to have the human genetic code be totally different than any other species. I mean, just so much crap went into the thinking, this so-called scientific thinking of the time. Uh, and people were, they, because of some of the early findings in genetics, people fought in a genetically deterministic fashion. You know, you know breakthroughs like finding the gene associated with uh, Huntington's disease, these were discoverable because, in fact, they're extremely rare diseases that narrow down to one gene. But people over-extrapolated, this must be how all biology is. Uh, so it was really driven by a fear. Um, looking at the data, I didn't believe that. And I figured it was uh, better to lead by example and show that I'm not afraid to have my genome on the internet uh, than tell, trying to convince somebody else it's okay for them to do it. You know, that, that didn't seem like a good way to do it. And also, scientific curiosity. I mean, how can you work in this field and not be curious about your own genome and your own life? Um, you know, I, it, it's been labeled as the, the highest evidence of arrogance and humanity, uh, but, uh, you know, if, that, if that's what scientific curiosity is about, then uh, we, we shall all be arrogant. Uh, yes? Um, you said that the coded doesn't mean understood. Right? And my question is, how do we go from decoded to understood? At the same time, you say that uh, you're going to be sequencing the genome of a lot of people and trying to get some information out of it. So my understanding is some kind of data mining that you associate the genotype with the phenotype. Is that the way we're going to proceed, or how are you going to... Yeah, I mean, it's got to be, obviously, a multivariant analysis. Uh, so you imagine a database with 10,000 complete human genomes, all the variations in those, uh, as complete as possible clinical records, psychological tests, uh, life outcomes, personality descriptions, uh, whatever we can measure. You know, just think of all the factors you could do to describe your life. Uh, and do that 10,000 different people, and then do the multivariate analysis to see what shows up as being genetic versus environmental. You know, we can actually try and answer what's nature and what's nurture. 10,000 is not a big enough number to answer all the questions, but it gets sort of the, the, a lot of the big ones. Uh, but if we can do 10,000, we can do 10 million. You know, right now we only have one and part of one, uh, you know, with, with Watson's. Um, you know, hopefully within a year we'll have a hundred or more. But think of ways to do the multivariant analysis. So there's, uh, you know, uh, roughly, you know, 10 million changes, variants in my genome. So if you have 10,000 people, 10 million different variants, you know, and doing multivariant analysis, somebody's going to have to come up with a better algorithm than we currently have. Yes? Well, in fact, uh, I, I didn't touch on that yet, so thanks for bringing that up. So earlier this year in PLOS Biology, we published a paper with six million new genes in it, which more than doubled the uh, uh, database of, of all uh, genes available to science. Uh, sometime early next year, we hope to double that number again. So right now, we have a database of roughly 10 million genes in it. And my view, these are our design components of the future. Next year, we'll have 20 million genes in our design database. If you liken that to the electronics industry, you only had handfuls of design units, resistors, capacitors, transistors. Uh, and so that's what we're doing with synthetic genomics. So the last 15 years, we've been digitizing biology. As we go from, I view biology as an analog world, we've been digitizing it, where now we have all this information in the computer, and now we're starting to go the other way we're starting with the sequence that's in the computer. We're building the analog molecules. Uh, and then we've developed ways to boot those up uh, to have new uh, life forms. So uh, 
with uh, 10 or 20 million different design components. We come up with a lot of variants on those. We're trying to do this right now uh, to design new um, uh, biofuels that uh, are going to be continuously renewable, either starting back with CO2, starting with sunlight. Uh, we have a new fuel that uh, we think is far better than ethanol and butanol. Uh, it doesn't freeze at high altitudes, so it could be a biojet fuel. Uh, and these are simple molecules that we can just design in the lab and then have biological systems make them. Uh, I think as this catches on, most things will start to be made by biological systems because these systems can do far more complex chemistry than our best chemists can. Yes? Uh, could you comment a bit about um, public funding of research and life sciences versus private funding? What's more effective at what and what the right mix is? Uh, well, for most scientists, the right mix is whatever you can get. Um, <laughs> You know, I mean, that, that, that's the reality of how it works. Uh, before World War II, most of the funding for basic science was private. Uh, after World War II, the government took over with the rise of NSF and NIH. Uh, but that's been falling, and it's now below 50% again of the funding. So uh, private companies, public companies, uh, uh, Foundations, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation is obviously the, the best example of that. Uh, private individuals. Um, my institute has a $100 million a year budget. Uh, probably 70 to 80 percent comes from government grants. Uh, the rest from uh, foundations like the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation, private donors, um, etc. But without other sources of money than the government, you can't really move forward in science. Uh, you know, the government is, you know, is constant breakthrough after breakthrough that our teams have had. We could never get funding from the government to fund the breakthrough. Once the breakthrough was made and we proved it worked, we could get all the funding we wanted from the government. Uh, it's a pretty lousy system. You know, uh, there were war awards like the uh, Proxmire Golden Fleece Award, who pulled down research titles and would uh, ridicule them in Congress and. You know, the government just get more and more skittish to the point with peer review, nobody wants to fund anything that's uh, risky at all. Uh, you know, science and society can't move ahead that way. So uh, all the uh, breakthroughs and discoveries that my teams have been associated with is because we had independent money to go do the initial experiment. And that we have a small endowment, that's what we try to do with it, we fund scientists when they have new ideas to get the, the breakthrough started and then try to switch to public funds. It's, it's a sad state with, you know, this, uh, uh, you know, $200 billion federal budget for science uh, that it's hard to get new ideas. Uh, and somehow I think uh, there's going to be more and more pressure for that to change. Yes, sir. I mean, it's a complex question. Here, let me tell you why. So when we were doing the Sorcerer 2 expedition and taking samples every 200 miles around the world, uh, we had to have three full-time people working with the State Department to negotiate to be able to take a barrel of water from the ocean uh, to look at the genetic code of the organisms that were in there. Um, a lot of countries uh, didn't want the information to be made publicly available. Uh, so, you know, it's interesting there, everybody's all for stuff being made public until, unless they might own it, uh, and, and that takes on a different status. Uh, you know, 
organisms that uh, are out in the open ocean. Uh, for example, when we sailed across the Pacific from the Galapagos to French Polynesia, there's roughly a one knot current that moves across the ocean. Uh, roughly every 200 miles in the ocean, we found in a barrel of seawater 40,000 new species. And if those are out in international waters, anybody can make discoveries on them and publish them in the scientific literature or whatever you want to do with them. As soon as that one night knot current takes them across the 200 mile barrier uh, into French Polynesia, they become French genetic heritage. Um, and that's part of the complexity. Uh, there are a number of indigenous species in different areas that are truly indigenous to them. Uh, you know, we kind of uh, like those rules in this country in terms of trying to keep people out from fishing in our waters. So I guess it doesn't matter whether you're after uh, salmon or after bacteria. Um, we signed agreements with uh, many of the countries that if we commercially developed anything, we'd come back and negotiate with them some type of uh, uh, royalty back. But we were doing basic science. All our data is in the public literature. Uh, it's in these public databases. Uh, a lot of countries don't understand that and don't like it. Um, you know, so it, it's a very complex issue. It really has nothing to do with patenting. It has to do with benefit sharing. Um, you know, most countries are wise to this now. If a pharmaceutical company is going down looking for new medicines, you have to have an agreement with that country to give them some royalty back. I, I don't think that's unfair. Just the rules are also very inhibitory of basic science. I don't know if that answers your question or not. Okay. Yes. Um, well, in the future, following your research and other research in the area, it will be possible to say get a drop of blood and see if a person is technically inclined to engineering or not, for example. And we've seen lots of stories of movies. Uh, Gattaca is one. You don't do that here at Microsoft. <laughs> <laughs> uh, where you know. It's <laughs> Entrance examination is a drop of blood, right? Uh, how do you see that in the, in the context of your research and research in the end? Uh, well, you don't even need a drop of blood. A fingerprint on a glass will work too. But uh, the, the reality is, you know, that that's the genetic deterministic argument, right? So it, it doesn't work in science. It could be interesting if it did, but it, it really doesn't. It's more of an issue with. Uh, Large corporations, and I, I don't know what Microsoft does, but a lot of companies now self-insure. So they're the same as insurance companies. And so the concern is uh, if employers have your genetic information and you have an increased risk of colon cancer uh, and the other person being considered for hiring doesn't, maybe they'll hire him or her instead of you because you could end up costing the company more money in the long run. So there's been a bill pending in Congress, the genetic non-discrimination bill that passed the Senate, uh, has a couple hundred co-sponsors in the House. Uh, Republicans are blocking it from coming out of committee, but it would prevent employers from using genetic information as a discriminatory tool in employment. Um, I, I think we need to keep, think carefully whether we want to block insurance companies from doing it. Uh, my view is we want insurance companies to understand the preventative medicine paradigm and that it costs less to prevent diseases than to treat them. And why shouldn't they use it as long as they can't use that as a basis of denying somebody insurance? Uh, I don't know how many of you have life insurance. Maybe your company provides that for you. But if you go out on your own to get a life insurance policy, they take your genetic history. They measure your blood pressure. Uh, they measure your blood lipids. They'll give you an EKG. Uh, if you're a male of any age, they charge you more than if you're a female of any age. If you're uh, older, they charge you more than if you're younger. Genetic information is used all the time in policy underwriting. So I don't see any differences there using genetic information. What we don't want is people being frozen out of the healthcare system uh, because of that. You know, people are worried about pre-existing conditions. I, I, one thing I guarantee, if everybody gets their genome done, we will all have pre-existing conditions. So it's a, <laughs> it'll create a shared risk pool. Two more okay, two more questions. There's one there. 
the group in Jerusalem that controls the Dead Sea Scrolls have been very close. They were very closely held. They never published their transcriptions, but they did publish a concordance, which is exactly what you yeah. said. You, you know, snippets around particular words mm -hmm. and some rather clever people using techniques like yours, but 10 years before, had reconstructed the Dead Sea Scrolls. And I'm curious, did you know about that and were you at all influenced by that? I, I knew that was going on. Look, random approaches in shotgun sequencing has been going on uh, for decades, actually. Um, and the algorithms have been pretty basic for trying to reassemble things. They were just limited. You, you couldn't get beyond a thousand elements, a thousand sequences. Uh, and a lot of people thought the calculation would get too complicated to try and go beyond it. So, you know, shotgun sequencing has been part of sequencing almost from the beginning. Um, I guess nobody felt the need to develop algorithms to go beyond a thousand because it seemed like such a big number uh, as people were trying just to sequence single genes. Uh, I, I don't know why it didn't develop more. You know. I, I got a lovely note that's actually published in my book from Fred Sanger, who developed uh, uh, the, the major sequencing method that most of us used. And he sequenced the, the, the first genome. It was a viral genome. Um, and he sent me a note of congratulations when we published the first genome in 1995. And uh, uh, he said he always thought these approaches would work, uh, but all his colleagues wanted to own their own piece of DNA, and they didn't want to share. <laughs> Uh, so he never got a chance to do the experiment. So I, I think people have been thinking of these for a long time. Hopefully that work influenced the Dead Sea Scrolls. I don't know. <laughs> Last question. What are some of the challenges in computer science and database management, or data management problems that you're facing today in research? Well, it's, it's uh, I mean, you guys can think of the scale issues. Um, I mean, it's been constantly, as, as we go to change the scale, uh, e even the, 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 the pairwise comparisons and handling 25,000 sequences was considered overwhelming to most. Uh, then jumping up to 27 million sequences. Then it turns out the sequence part of it is not so difficult for any one of us. Um, you know, memories become very cheap, uh, certainly relative to what it used to be. But when you think of all the phenotypic information, you know, one MRI scan, uh, you know, there's probably uh, more, more bits than the genome would be. Uh, trying to find ways to correlate all these different types of information with variations in the genetic code. Trying to do this first tens of times, then hundreds of times, then thousands, tens of thousands. We, we have six billion people going to nine billion people. If, if billions of people had their genome sequence, how would we handle the data? What would we do with it? How could we analyze it? Uh, I, I think um, I, I had a nice uh, debate with Gordon Moore. I, I said sequencing was changing faster than Moore's law. So Venter's law trumped Moore's law. He said, but you're dependent on computing, so Moore's law always wins. <laughs> and we're totally dependent on, on what happens at, at the forefront of computing, software, algorithm development. Uh, without it, uh, we can't move forward. So. We're, we're dependent on you guys. <laughs> Thank you very much.